Face. 
Good morning. It's good to see you today. Thank you so much for being here. It is a joy to stand before you. And we live in paradise, don't we? I'll tell you, the days are beautiful, and, and, and so is the season, and I'm glad you're here. Does anyone just have any Christmas parties lately? Yeah, and if you don't, you have many to come. The big joke today is that in our home, we have a family, Becky's family, the dysfunctional side. Uh, you know, the, that's uh, this today, believe it or not. So there'll be 40 people at my house this afternoon. And thank goodness by Saturday, the Bauckham side will come and let us see how truly normal this side is. So that'll be next week. So there'll be a 40 there next week. So lots, lots of fun. But, you know, we look back on the times of family gatherings and, and I think about family and Christmas and those kinds of things, but I think about community. And I can't imagine not having the Christmas Eve service because we've had it for many years. And what is it? It's about a 45-minute service that has great drama and music and uh, candle lighting and a story from the pastor. It is a magical night for 45 minutes. By the time you get here, you'll be going out and going, wow, that happened so quickly. But it's a great add-on to whatever Christmas Eve celebration you're having. So that's on Saturday. And it's at, it just, it's at 3 o'clock, 4.30, and 6 o'clock, three different services. You pick which one you want. We, uh, in your hand today, you have some tickets, some notifications. If you want to ask your friends, we have plenty of space, but just to let you know, hey, good way to ask somebody. If you want to come to something that's very uh, wonderful about the season, this is it. And we put a lot of effort in it just so you can invite your friends. It's a great uh, memory for us. So that's happening during those times. And also I want to remind you, and I need to do this several times, that on the Sunday, Christmas Sunday, that's the last Sunday of the year, and we are closed. So what does it mean? There's 100 volunteers that make this work. We value them, and every year we give them the one week off. So if you come on Christmas Sunday, you might be lonely. But uh, you're welcome to come here and sit in the parking lot That's if you want to. But uh, that's happening on Christmas Day, so all the services will be on Saturday night, Christmas Eve, and it is magical. You'll enjoy that. So as we begin today, we're in the series of Advent, and really it's about, you know, Heavenly Christmas. What is this about? We talked the first week about, you know, the, the importance of hope, how that hope is something that you project in the future, that life is about hope. I have friends of mine who are, who are lifetime friends, and I said, what would you miss if, you know, why do you come to church at all? They live in North Florida. They said, you know, we go to church and we want to be a part of a community because we're looking for hope. That when I watch the news, this is not all there is. It's not just this big diversity that we have between right and left and everything is a big deal and it's blown out of proportion. Maybe it is, or maybe it's the media, I don't know. But I do want to come to church I want to put all that aside and say, you know, I hope that the world tomorrow is going to be better than it is today. I hope for things. I hope. And then last week, you know, we talked about peace. And what a great topic to talk about. We talked about how important it is that peace is not just something you get. It's something you live in. It's the shalom of God. And, and you know, Pastor Troy did an excellent job teaching us. It's about a lifestyle. We lean into it. It's something within us. And today, I want to chat with you about waiting. Next week, I want to talk to you about joy. But waiting. Do you believe the older you get, the easier it is to wait? Hmm. Some people are going yes. Some people are going no. I don't know. Maybe. Maybe not. But in Luke chapter 2, let's look at what the New Testament says about it. Now, there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel. Really, what does that mean? He was waiting for things to get better. And the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he'd seen the Lord's Messiah. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. When the parents brought in the child, Jesus, uh, the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God saying, almost you can see him with his hands uplifted with this baby. Sovereign Lord, as you promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you prepared in sight of all the nations, a light for revelation to the, to the Gentiles and the glory of your people, Israel. You know, there are three truths I want us to consider today. And you have your notes. You can fill in the blank if you want. But uh, here's the first one. Be patient and trust God despite the wait. 
You know, this older guy, Simeon, was waiting for the consolation of Israel, for Israel to be consoled, for things to get better. And I love to talk about the history of Israel. Some of you have been to Israel with me. You understand the trip. And some of you picked up brochures even today because we're going again a year from January. But what, what does that mean? In the history of Israel, about 2000 B.C., there was Abraham. And Abraham was married to Sarah. And they had this promise that they were going to have a child. And they did have a child. And, it gets, and then there was Hagar in there too. We'll talk about that in a minute. But then, then there's Abraham. Then Isaac had Rebekah. And then Jacob had wives and had 12 sons. 2000 B.C. About 1900 B.C., Joseph convinced his family that because there was a huge famine in the land to move to Egypt. And Israel went to Egypt just for the famine. And they stayed there 400 years. It's like having company over, isn't it? I mean, come on, that's a long time. But after many years, they wanted to go home and they couldn't get out of there. And then Moses comes along and he, he comes in and, and after 400 years, he's the man of God to lead them out of bondage. And this is about 1400 BC and he takes them out. And then they wander for 40 years in the wilderness just to get from point A to point B. 200 miles, 40 years, not good distance per day. But for 400 years of waiting, 40 years of waiting. And about 1400 B.C., Joshua conquered Jericho. But even then, it wasn't just a day battle. It took seven days. In 1000 B.C., Israel was at its heyday, kind of like the United States. They ruled. It was the golden era. King David built this big temple. It was a wonderful thing. David and Solomon and wisdom, 1000 B.C., the best Israel ever saw. They rule the roost. They own the world, so to speak, in the known world. But about what happens in families, you know, King David got old and passed it on. There was a big, who's going to be the king after that? Finally, Solomon stepped up, was the king. And after that, they stepped up, who's going to be king? And they couldn't figure it out. And there was two kings, and they said, look, uh, we're going to split the kingdom. We're kind of like we're going to split the inheritance or split the family business. It's not going to be one thing. We're going to split it into two. And there was the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. And they had different kings and both from David's lineage and they ruled north and south. The north they called Israel, the south they called Judah. About 722, so I'm jumping hundreds of years, 722 BC, the northern kingdom was attacked and wiped out by Assyria. And all the, the key ingredients in the north were pulled into exile. South did not help them. Hey, you guys did your own thing. You're separate from us. You're kind of the dysfunctional family in the north. You're on your own. And they were. And they were exiled. About 586, the southern kingdom was attacked by Babylon and taken into exile. Pretty soon there's no one in the north. There's no one in the south except a few who had hidden in the hills. And then about 536, uh, King Cyrus, who Persia defeated, you know, Babylon, who had defeated Assyria. Now he said all to all these Israel, you can all go home. I want you to go home. And if you read the Bible throughout the books, Ezra and Nehemiah, it's about them going home. About 200 BC, under Roman rule, Jerusalem existed but was being oppressed. And they didn't like it. Finally, in 5 BC, I don't, I don't know the math, but 5 BC, Jesus was born. How'd that happen? Well, actually, Jesus was born at the right time, but calendaring has not always been good. So the calendar later on, they said, ah, the guy that set all the calendar, he was off by about five years. Anyway, 5 BC, Jesus was born. He is the one who brings hope. He's a leader. But listen carefully. It took a 1,000 years to get from King David and the, this great time of life to Jesus. Now, a 1,000 years to get back to where they were. When it takes me an extra 10 minutes on I-75 to get to university, I'm pretty annoyed. Do you see the difference in scope? I confess that I'm impatient in some things about some things. I'm, I'm impatient, I confess it. But other things, I'm very patient. When Becky and I used to go to Publix together, uh, you know, and shop, we did grocery shopping, I'd have the cart. And I'm one of those guys that, you know, I'm looking for the shortest line. So I'm looking and I'm just monitoring the lines and waiting for, you know, I'm not up there yet, but I'm just waiting to see who's going to move so I can move in. And then I see the cashier, male or female, and they got the black box and they're going to an empty register and I'm stalking them. I'm kind of moving down the way. I just want to, finally when they pull in, I pull in there and I check out and I feel pretty good. 
So, you know, I don't like to wait in Publix, but I want you to know I've changed. I don't go to Publix anymore. So, right, that's the change. When I fly, and Becky and I love to travel, I, I've noticed this about myself, I'm just revealing. I, I always am looking for the next phase of travel. Not what do you mean by the next phase? I want to get to the airport. If it's the day I'm going to fly out, and I'm going to fly at 11 o'clock, I want to be there plenty early. Because I don't like the stress of going in the airport and almost missing a flight. Have you ever missed a flight? I have. It's terrible stress. I mean, but I get to the airport. I want to get there early. So I get there early. We drive usually probably more than the speed limit to get there. And then you get there and you park the car. You get inside. There's plenty of time, but I can't wait to get in and get the bag checked. That's the first thing. Step one. Now we got to go through security, TSA. Now we have pre-check. We go through TCA we get, and we get to the gate. We get to the gate, we still have an hour or two, but once we get there, it's time to eat. So this is the process we go through. I don't know if that's what you, we do, but I didn't have a, I want to have some margin case there's a splat tire. I want to have some margin case TSA is backed out. I want to have some margin. And then we get there and wait, we get on the plane. I want to be first on the plane. Do you? I have credit cards with a couple of airlines that allow me to get first on the plane. I have these credit cards because I get early entry on the plane. They say, Pastor, you're sick. Yes. I don't go to Publix either. So then what happens when you get on the plane? Let's take off. We don't need, what are we waiting on? Let's get going. Come on, everybody sit down. Get your bags put up. Let's go. Let's take off. And as soon as we take off, I track it. When are we going to land? And as soon as we land, the first person to stand up once the light goes off is me. Why? Because I've been sitting a long time. Do you know that I know that I'm not going to get off the plane any earlier? You can sit there or stand there. It doesn't matter. Everybody gets off in front of you. If you step in front of someone, you're being rude. And I just don't see that happen. It's what you should do. But that's what we do. Do you know in 2015, this memorable flight, Becky and I flew to Ireland. We went from Tampa to Newark. We were at Tampa Airport and we were ready to take off twice and they delayed it because of mechanical issues. Finally pulled us back into the gate twice before we took off on the same plane. We get to Newark, we're flying to Ireland. We have two aborted takeoffs. By aborted, I mean we're doing 80 miles an hour down the runway and they stop. And we pull back in, we're gonna try it again. 80 miles an hour, we stop again. We get back in. They change planes. I don't care if they change planes, but you know, I take one of these little ambience to sleep. <laughs> Never take those until you're in the air. I know I was in the airport, I just don't remember. But we flew and had a great time in Ireland. We came back to D.C. This is the same flight. We fly into Washington, D.C. No problem getting to D.C., but to Tampa, the, the captain came on the, on the intercom. This is on the same trip. He said, folks, let's quote, there's too much oil dripping from the engine. We're going to get maintenance to take a look at it and check it out. An hour later, after the maintenance said it was okay, we took off. Now, I've spent too much time on a plane sitting on the ground. But I want you to hear me carefully. I'm learning. Waiting is not necessarily wasting. I love to turn this into a time of reflection. I wish I'd learned this earlier in my life. Or sometimes you can just catch up on reading. But waiting is not wasting time. Waiting is part of life. I love to talk to some of the pregnant ladies at Suncoast come in the other when they're really I mean about to have the baby I remember talking to one not too long ago they, every phase is exciting and, and the, one lady came in and said oh I just can't I can't believe it I'm just I'm so uncomfortable I can't sleep I can't wait to have this baby I'm just so uncomfortable I can't sleep and she came back about a month later and she had the baby she goes you know I told you that I couldn't sleep she said what was I thinking <laughs> I was sleeping great then compared to now I mean Every phase is exciting. Pregnancy is a time of adjustment. But patients or parents, excuse me, parents need the waiting period, waiting period of nine months to get ready for a baby. I don't think you're equipped till you go through that process. And then you say, can you imagine if you had a baby and all of a sudden you, what was born was a teenager? That'd be like, uh-uh, I didn't sign up for this. Parents need a time of adjustment to have a baby, but they also need time of adjustment to have a two-year-old. And, and then a teenager takes years of adjustments. I think years of brain damage before you get to the place where you have a teenager. 
So here's some questions for you to consider. What am I going through right now that's preparing me for something greater? And why is this taking so long? Why do I have to wait? You ready for the answer? We all do. Well, that's not my answer. Well, beware, be aware of the possibilities in the wait. As a child, I had to wait until I was 12 years old. I wanted to drive early. I had to wait until I was 12 years old to get my first car. Pastor, you mean you had a car at 12 years old? Yes, I did. Where can you have a car at 12 years old? In the hills of Tennessee. That's where you can. On dirt roads. I wasn't allowed on the paved road. Doesn't mean I didn't drive on them. I just wasn't allowed. And at 12 years old, but you know, I really couldn't wait until I got my driver's license. So when you get your driver's license, 16, but I had to wait. I got on my 16th birthday. Then I was in Florida and I got my Florida license right after that. So I had two licenses. Why do you need two licenses? I don't know. Back then they didn't have computers. You could have as many, you could have one for every state at that point. But you know, I had to wait until I was a teen to get the license. As a teen, you know what I wanted to? I wanted to be an adult. You know, when you're a kid, you want to be a teen. When you're a teen, you want to be an adult. That's where I was. As an adult, I went to college and, and, and you know, people say, well, couldn't you, did you have to wait to get it? Couldn't you just wait to get a job? No, I worked as a kid. I worked as a teen. It's called slave labor. You know, one of the things about having a car, you had to pay for it. So you had to have a job to do those kind of things. I didn't have ever trouble. I never had to wait on a job. But I remember I wanted to get married. And I met this girl when I was about 18 years old. Her name is Becky. She's in the children's area right now. But we've been married for 47 years. We got married at 19 years old. That's young. You say, could you wait to add kids? Yeah, we, some things we learned to wait. Five years, we said, before we'd have kids. One of our more responsible things. And in those five years, we begin to watch parents and take lessons. And I, I said this before. I'll say it again. We were perfect parents before we had kids. We had it all figured out. And then the babies are born. And you go, what, what happens? I mean, I heard, from a, <laughs> I heard from a pregnant mother not too, recent, not, not too long ago. She said, I can't wait to give birth. I am so uncomfortable. And then she came back and she said, I'm so happy because this baby brings so much joy in my life. This baby brings so much purpose in the waiting. And sometimes we're in the, stuck in the waiting. We don't see the end results. 30 days, you know, what are you thinking? The baby doesn't sleep. But, but here's what's wrong with parenting. Many things, but it's when we don't enjoy the moment. I've heard them say, I can't wait till the next phase. And as the first kid, you want your first child to walk early. Man, when Laura was little, we want her to walk and she walked early. And then Stacy came along, we, okay, well, if she walks early or not, we're okay. Ryan, we tied his feet together. <laughs> I mean, the, th the third child, you go, let's keep them from doing all that stuff. But we get this thing, I can't wait till the next phase. I can't wait till they walk. I can't wait till they talk. Then you think, I can't wait till they quit talking. I can't wait till they go to kindergarten because then they're in school and we have a break during the day. Then there's a stage, I can't wait till they can drive themselves. And I have a grandson now that drives himself. Then you can't wait till they go to college, get a job. Can't wait till I have grandchildren. I can't wait till I'm an empty nester. I've gone through all those phases. You know, I say now, what I hear more from adults is, wow, I miss my kids. Here's the real concern. Don't miss the stages of your kids. Don't miss the stages of development. And please don't miss your life because that is your life. Enjoy the wait. Enjoy the journey. Simeon was waiting for Israel to be whole again. He was waiting for God to send a leader to restore God-centered society. Waiting is difficult for most of us to do. But you know, they put waiting rooms in different places, don't they? I mean, a car, if you want to get tires on your car, there's a waiting room. It's Jiffy Lube, there's a waiting room. Use some car washes have a waiting room. Doctor's offices all have waiting rooms. Hospitals have waiting rooms. You know, I have difficulty just standing around. I have difficulty just sitting and waiting. And I've been in the hospital more than my share, but I know where the cafeteria is in the hospital. I don't know where the places to go, where the snack shops, the gift shops are. Often I'll find those places just to kind of keep me busy. 
If I go to a doctor's office today, and I do because of my age and all the health things I try to do, and I expect a lengthy wait, you know what I take with me? I always take my briefcase. So you take your briefcase? Yeah. Sometimes the nurse says, whoa, you bring your briefcase. I go, yeah. Uh, I'm just trying to get some things done. And I also throw my laptop or, you know, and I look around. People used to wait. You know what they do now? They're working on their phones. What did we do before we had these devices that occupy all our thoughts? Maybe we actually thought. Maybe we reflected. Maybe we weren't so busy answering all the questions of life, we begin to ask the questions of life. Today, we don't like to wait. Some people don't like to wait for a moment. When the light turns red, beep. And if it's a black pilot behind you, sorry. I mean, maybe people are texting. I, I drive through the school as they do uh, pickup, and people are waiting. I don't think out of 10 cars, there's one of them that's not on the phone. It's a, it's a constant preoccupation. And I'm grateful for it. But sometimes we miss some things waiting. I love the story of the, about the pastor who was making a wooden trellis to support a climbing vine. As he's pounding away. He noticed the little boy was watching from across the street. The youngster didn't say a word. But the pastor kept on working, thinking the boy wouldn't leave. But he didn't. He just didn't leave. Pleased at the thought of his work being admired, the pastor finally said, well, son, you trying to pick up, pick up some pointers on building? He said, no. I'm just waiting to hear what a pastor says when he hits his thumb. <laughs> I, I was talking with Ed this week, one of our guys around here that does a lot of work. He's in the maintenance building helping handling with his truck, and he was frustrated working on handling his truck. Power steering, something about the power steering. Trying to take it off, but wouldn't bolt on right. And he said that was so frustrating, he confessed later. He says, I was cursing up a storm over frustration. Someone said, what'd you say? He said, I was saying, Larry Bauckham, Larry Bauckham, Larry Bauckham, Larry Bauckham. <laughs> so that's been a joke this week that I'm the curse words that people say. <laughs> I'm just glad to be remembered. Anyway, but here's what I want you to hear me clearly. Oh, to discover patience. That waiting is not necessarily a bad thing. Oh, to discover how to handle my attitude when I am impatient. See, my attitude determines my response. Some days you may drive up the road and it's no big deal. And other days, everything annoys you. Everybody's slow. And maybe it's the same traffic, just the same, but the difference is in, is in my head or your head. See, my attitude determines my response. My attitude determines my inward churning, my annoyance. In the Bible, we find as real people had difficulty waiting. Abraham and Sarah they were, had this promise that they were going to have a son. And she didn't get pregnant fast enough. And since she had a handmaiden, Hagar, and she realized there was going to be a baby and she wasn't getting pregnant, she said, look, Abraham, just sleep with this young, beautiful slave girl of mine. And when she has a baby, I'll can claim it as my own. And that'll be the son of promise. I don't think that would go very well today, do you? I, I don't. But anyways, they, they were, she was impatient. And Hagar gave birth to a son, Ishmael. And then later, Sarah got pregnant and she had a son, Isaac. And when Isaac was born, Sarah's like, look, I, I guess we jumped the gun here a little bit, but I want Hagar and I want Ishmael to leave. And it's a whole story in the, in the Old Testament. But if she'd waited a little longer, if they waited a little longer, maybe this other thing wouldn't have happened. The Israelites under Moses' leadership could not wait. Moses is up on the mountain of God getting the 10 commandments. And he's there for 40 days or season of time. And the people are so frustrated that they cannot wait on him because he didn't bring back the Ten Commandments soon enough. They created a golden calf. And when he finally comes down, he's frustrated. He's frustrated because they would not wait. Do you know that some scholars think that Judas, you know the betrayer, the one who betrayed the treasure? They think that Judas betrayed Jesus because Judas was impatient that Jesus was not going as fast as he was. I can almost hear Judas saying to the other disciples, you know, Jesus is a good guy. Man, he's just got the words, but he really doesn't know how this government thing's gonna work. We need to push him a little bit. Maybe if I'm able to, to sell him out, I'm gonna call his hand, then he's gonna step forward because Jesus is not going as fast as Judas wanted him to. He went and sold him for 30 pieces of silver. 
And when he saw they arrested him and saw what happened, he realized his plan was flawed. And it tells us that Judas went out and killed himself. He threw the silver back and said, hey, this is not what I bargained for. And scholars think he really was just trying to push things a little quickly. It was his impatience that created all the problem. Many of our problems are of our own making. We cannot wait, so we sleep ahead before we give the process of life a chance to act. Why wait? We want it now. We live in a day, and I've lived there too, of calendars and schedules and clocks. But listen very carefully. I'm pretty convinced of this. God does not use a calendar. He doesn't watch the clock. He doesn't have an iPhone. And he probably doesn't complain about cell service. He's not on a schedule like we think he is. Can we pause just a minute? The Christmas season is upon us. And one of the traditional themes is taking a deep breath and waiting. It's time realizing that waiting is part of life. Israel waited 400 years, then 40 years. Simeon waited his entire life to see the hope in his arms. But when he finally saw it, he said, oh God, this is what my life has lived for. To see this child. Now here's the good news. Which number two, when you trust God while you wait, you will not be disappointed. I mean, he wanted to see the cross child before he died. It appeared this old man had been waiting for years. Today, I want to encourage you, could you be a little more patient? To that middle school teenage girl boy, could I say wait? If you're a kid, teenager, wait sexually. To the one who's offered drugs and told just try it, don't give in. To the six-year-old who wants to look like they're 12, could we just get them to wait? To the 12-year-old that wants to look like they're 18, could we get them to wait? To the young adult couple who want to have everything their parents have after a lifetime, could we just wait? Why can't we wait? Because we live in a world of instant. Everything's instant. Emails, texts. We carry around a computer in our, our hand to get all the answers. Waiting. Being still is not too popular. But this question works for us today. Lord, will you teach us to wait? Would you teach us in the waiting of life to connect with you? Now, you've heard it said, don't pray for patience, and I don't, because the lessons that teach patience are often painful. However, the scripture says this, those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up as wings on eagles. They shall walk and not grow weary. They shall, and they shall run and not grow weary. They shall walk and not faint. See, I often see tired people forcing deadlines on God. People demanding things from God on their schedule. They grow impatient. They don't want to wait. What God wants from us is in the waiting to lean into him, to live in the moment and trust some of the promises of life and the process, which leads to the last thought. It's this. Our eyes are open to God in the delays of life. Moved by the Holy Spirit, Simeon went, Simeon went to the temple courts. He had to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. The day Simeon took his, this child into his arms, it was in the routine of life that all of a sudden God broke in on him. Can you imagine what you've been waiting for your entire life now happens to you? I love to tell the story about somebody I know. TJ, who's in the sound booth today, is Pierce, his great-grandfather. He didn't know him, but I did. Isn't it amazing when you know someone's great-grandfather and they don't? I remember being in somebody's house. He was 80 years old. It was his 80th birthday. I stopped to talk to Byron, and he was a cratchety old guy. Didn't come to church a lot with his wife. She wanted to be in the community. He was like, no, I'm not about this stuff. And finally, one day, he said, can you stop by? And as I talked to him, he said, look, I, I've decided I want to be a part of the community. I want to be a part of a Christ follower. I don't know what that means, but I want to be in. And it's amazing. I prayed with him. And we talked about it, and the light came on in his life. And it's almost the same light that I see with Simeon. Sovereign Lord, as you promised, now dismiss your service. I finally get it. I understand what was a routine ritual for Mary and her weak old son was fulfillment of someone else their entire life. What we, when we do what is right, God uses it to help others. What Simeon had waited for finally was actualized. So what are you saying, Pastor? I'm saying this. In this Christmas season... Don't get in a hurry. 
Don't get caught in what I call the hurry disease. And when you are having to wait, take a moment, reflect on how good your life is. How are you doing? Good. How is your life? It's great. Is it perfect? No. Will it ever be perfect? No. Is it good? Yes. Could it be better? Maybe. Could it be worse? Oh, yeah. Why don't we begin to brag on all the good things and praise God for all the blessings that he gives us in life? <sighs> Am I going to have to wait today? Yeah. Did you guys going to have to wait to get out of here? Oh, yeah. But in the process, is there something we can learn? Oh, yeah. Let me pray for you. Father, thank you for your love and grace. Thank you for the way you teach us in these moments. We confess to you. We all have been impatient. And most of us would rather not wait. But thank you for the teaching that in the times that we do, may it not send us off the deep end of negativity. But simply may we use these times as moments of reconnection with who we are and who you are and life itself. May your spirit live in and through us, we pray, in every moment in Christ's name. Amen. Would you stand, please? I'm going to tell you a story in closing. I remember a few years ago, Ryan had a Honda Fit, and he had some trouble with a tire, and I was need to be repaired and balanced, so he took it down to Midas. And right before he went into Midas, his windshield wipers were so bad, his windshield wipers, he said, I'm going to... I'm going to put new windshield wipers on his car. And he put them on there. And the guy from Midas, after he fixed the tire, he drove his car. And he came back, and it was raining a little bit. And he told Ryan, he said, Ryan, man, dude, we need to put windshield wipers on your car. Ryan said, I just put brand new wipers on. He said, they work terrible. He said, I can't believe that new wipers are so bad. And the guy said, did you take this little silicone shield off? Ryan said, nope. And he took it off. It's amazing what you can see when you take this plastic cover off your windshield wipers. So this season, what I want you to do is take and unwrap Christmas. Get to the core. Get those things that are keeping your windshield foggy. Remove them and see the message of Christ to your heart and life. And that is that he loves you. And so do I. God bless. Thanks for coming today. Thank you.